This is a CBC Podcast. I said, do you know who did it? And he said, we have a very good idea who the responsible person was. Uncover Bomb on Board, investigating the biggest unsolved mass murder in Canada, CP Flight 21. Get the Uncover podcast for free on Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts. Available now. Dante, Anine, Buju, hello and welcome. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild. Indigenous languages across Turtle Island were almost silenced. Out of the 90 living languages left in Canada, three out of four are said to be almost extinct. Now, new federal legislation in Canada aims to bring language back to life. But Indigenous peoples have been working on revitalizing their languages for years. Today on Radio Indigenous, from podcasts and Hollywood blockbusters to sign language and language nests. How Indigenous people are learning, sharing and speaking their own languages. On February 5th, the Honourable Pablo Rodriguez, Minister of Canadian Heritage and Multiculturalism, stood in the House of Commons to introduce Bill C-91, an act respecting Indigenous languages. Que tanse ununsakut tanche kilaskala. Bonjour à tous. C'est un énorme honneur d'être ici avec vous dans le territoire traditionnel des Algonquins Anishinaabeg. We stand here as partners who have come together in a spirit of mutual respect, trust, and cooperation to advance reconciliation. Earlier today, I had the honor of introducing the Indigenous Language Act in the House of Commons. And this is a major milestone in our journey to reconciliation. This legislation sets up the Office of the Commissioner of Indigenous Languages, an office meant to protect and promote languages including Cree, Ojibwe, Oji Cree, Mohawk, Mi'kmaq, Michif, Inuktitut, and others. It's also tasked with things like funding immersion programs, setting up educational materials and permanent records of Indigenous languages, doing research and creating tools to ensure the languages are being spoken. Rodriguez said the new legislation satisfies three calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which were created in an effort to start repairing harm caused by residential schools and advance reconciliation efforts in Canada. And while we cannot change the past, we can and we must together, we must together work for a better future. Perry Belgard is the National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations. He was there for the announcement and sees this as a step forward. With the passing of this bill, when it gets passed, there's hope. You know, like we've drawn a line in the sand. Not one more Indigenous language will be lost. And so there's hope that we can revitalize and rejuvenate and, and get fluency back amongst our young, young men and women. We're, we still feel the intergenerational effects of the residential schools. You know, and I made the point that the Crown and the federal government has an obligation to use as much resources to rejuvenate our languages as the, the amount of resources they use to exterminate our languages. And, and so they have an obligation in that regard. But when we've, we've studies have shown that when you're fluent in your language, you're more successful in school. You know who you are and where you come from. The biggest test will be when we see fluency amongst our little ones. You know, when we can see them speaking their language, no matter what tribe or nation you go to. Perry Belgard is the National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations. Jesse Wente is Director of the Indigenous Screen Office and a columnist for Toronto's morning show, Metro Morning. He said he wants to see this revitalization being driven by the communities, since that's where most of this work is already being done. The key really is that these languages, and there are some 60 Indigenous language groups uh, in Canada, in what is currently called Canada, hold so much of their culture within them. So much of their worldview is contained within those languages. Their ways of knowing and being are contained there. The, the relational aspect of the indigenous worldview mm -hmm. is all held in these languages. So they really represent 
much more than just linguistics. This is how indigenous people see the world and the relationships that comprise it. And so restoration of these languages represents restoration of so much more than just the language themselves. And this is really a major steps towards ensuring a very different future for indigenous peoples. Indigenous languages are often described as being lost or vanishing. And that's incorrect. Uh, these languages are not lost. The, they are stolen, stolen at the behest of government. So it's appropriate that the government participates in giving these languages back to these communities. And this has to be done. You know, this is uh, reparations, if you want, on the part of the Canadian government, acknowledging this was something we took. And as part of reconciliation, what we should be looking at is how much of what was taken can be returned. That was Jesse Wente speaking to Metro Morning host Matt Galloway after Bill C-91, an act respecting Indigenous languages, was announced earlier this month. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169 and Native Voice 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild. More and more speakers are turning to technology to share their traditional languages through Facebook groups, apps and podcasts. Being in Toronto, like I noticed that I was speaking and thinking and dreaming in mm-hmm. English, <laughs> which I find okay. I mean, it's fine. I have to communicate anyways uh, in English. But then there's this deeper part of me, I guess, that was like, you know, hey, hello, you're Cree. <laughs> in just a few minutes, I'll tell you about a new podcast done entirely in East Cree. And speaking of podcasts, did you know we have a weekly podcast that focuses on Indigenous languages? It's called First Words, and a new episode comes out every Tuesday. Our next guest is Eli Langley, a member of the Coshada tribe of Louisiana. He believes he's the youngest member of his tribe to be fluent in their Indigenous language, Kawazadi. When he got into Harvard University, he wanted to use his education to revitalize the language. But doing that wasn't easy until he had a breakthrough in November. My name is Eli Langley. I am Bertney Langley's son. I am Linda Langley's son. I'm from Elton, Louisiana. I'm a member of the Cushada tribe of Louisiana. I just got Harvard University to recognize my endangered indigenous language, and I feel amazing. Ayixa. Uh, Ayixa means clan. In, in the tribe, there are seven clans, all of which are, are animals. And clans are essentially family units in the tribe. The clan is passed through your mother. So for me, my father is Kashada and my mother is not Kashada. So I don't have a clan. But my, my father is Bobcat. My grandmother, his mother, was Bobcat. So I would tell people, Ayiksaka Mikso, Katik which means I don't have a clan, but I'm a white bobcat. After my senior year of high school, in the summer of 2016, uh, in, the, in our tribal heritage department, we did an immersion program. The, the passion that I, that I had for, for wanting to learn the language, and like kind of, I ended up really eating it up and <clears throat> being really committed to, to the effort even two, three, four years ago, a large portion of the community thought that you couldn't learn the language as a second language. If you learned English first, there was no chance for you to learn Kowasadi. So the immersion program was probably the starting point for me um, gaining a significant amount of fluency. There are maybe 200 to 300 uh, Kowasadi speakers, and of that group... I, at 20 years old, am the youngest speaker of this language. If I don't teach my children or if I don't continue advocating for for this and attempting to uh, save our language in this way, there's a possibility that I will be the last person that ever speaks this language, which is 
uh, a really heavy thing to think, but um, life is long, and I'm committed to, to making sure that that is not the case. There are a lot of terms in Kawasaki that I really like. <clears throat> the, the one that uh, has stuck with me the most uh, in my process of learning the language is probably itachaki, uh, which means brother. But the two parts of the word are itta, which kind of means together, and achaki, which means to go along with. So an almost more literal translation of that word would be someone who goes along with you. And I think that's really beautiful. Almost a, a literal um, idea of what it means to be a brother um, or a sibling is, you know, a person that will follow, will follow you, will go with you, um, and stick stick with you. I guess through the the thick and thin. In English, a lot of the emphasis is on the nouns and adjectives, whereas in Kawasaki, the entire language is based on verbs. So. The word for chair is pachakoka, which means what you sit on. The word for table is pa olimpa, which is what we eat on. So itachaki, I think, is a really beautiful shorthand for how we think. Whenever I got to Harvard in the fall of 2016, I was really hot on the language. I had, like, dedicated my whole summer to learning it. Uh, I felt really, really good about my progress. I was basically totally conversational by the time I left home. I was considering doing it as a fifth class, an independent study, anything like that. But I was met with a lot of well-meaning people running me around, basically. I was told a lot about the handbook, the bylaws, the faculty rulings on this kind of stuff, and basically told that there was no way to go forward with what I was hoping to go forward with was told to take other languages. There is no good justification for Harvard saying this language is worthy of recognition and it matters, and this other language here isn't worthy of recognition and doesn't matter. So about a month and a half ago, um, I received word that that we would be able to move forward with uh, an examination in Kawasaki, and then shortly after that, um, I received word from uh, the registrar's office that my record had been updated, my transcript had been updated to say that um, I had fulfilled the language requirement in Kawasaki. And that was just the most amazing feeling. That was Eli Langley, a member of the Koshata tribe of Louisiana, sharing words in Kawasaki. Thanks to Katie Toth and Yellowknife for sharing his story. That episode of our Indigenous Language Podcast, First Words, will hit the podcast waves next week. If you want to download episodes you missed and get all the new ones, head to cbc.ca slash podcasting and sign up for Unreserved. <laughs> That was a bit of In Iuschi, a Cree podcast created by Nick Wapachi. Nick grew up speaking East Cree in Quebec, but is now based in Toronto. He hosts and produces his own Cree podcast with some help from his partner, Amanda Quinn. Both Nick and Amanda join us now from Toronto. Welcome to you both. Hello. Thank you so much. Thanks well, for having us. Awesome. Thank you for being here. Nick, let's start with you. What is your podcast about? My sh our show is called N E U S G. So we basically came up with the idea where we wanted to speak to our people in our nation, really gathering their thoughts and ideas, and then really get them to speak to us to tell their stories. The other element, I guess, that we added into this podcast is we wanted to speak to elders and then have them tell stories and to people that are listening. What we wanted to do basically was to create this podcast because we've been noticing that, you know, younger, more younger generations are not really speaking their language and they're more prone to speaking in English. So mm. they're more in tuned and being part of social media and stuff and really being 
connected online. So one of our elders uh, in the Cree Nation, his name is Roby Matthew Sr., he basically said, like, you know, I see this issue that's happening, but, you know, it's not really talked about. And so we had that conversation, and that's basically how it sparked the idea to create this podcast so that we can maybe hopefully help or inspire people to speak their language and listen to Cree content. Mm. And what does EUSG mean? So EUSG means the people's land. Ah. Yeah. And now you had mentioned that you ask Cree elders to tell stories and talk about memories. What kinds of stories and memories do they do they share with you? Yeah, so I'm really interested in them telling me their stories about, you know, what they used to do in the bush because like in today's world, I guess like it's kind of different from what they were used to growing kind up, <laughs> right? So I wanted to get them to tell me their their story of what mm-hmm. their life was like. That must be so <laughs> exciting because that's so rare for people to gather, you know, the stories of our elders and, and how it used to be. Um, how does it feel for you? Like, what does it mean for both of you to to be doing this work? Well, it means that we can, you know, I guess reconnect with our roots, reconnect with our culture and our language. And, you know, being in Toronto, like I noticed that I was speaking and thinking and dreaming in Mm -hmm. English, (laughs) which I find okay. I mean, it's fine. I have to communicate anyways uh, in English. But then there's this deeper part of me, I guess, that was like, you know, hey, hello, you're Cree. <laughs> What's up? Tante. Tante. You know, all these different things. So um, it, I kind of felt compelled to really connect to my culture, even though I'm in an urban setting. Like mm. I can still be Cree uh, living here and speaking in Cree and doing those practices and, you know, going to ceremonies and all that stuff. So and doing this podcast definitely really inspired me. You know, he could not be doing this this work alone, of course, and that's where you come in, Amanda. How do you help Nick out with the podcast? Um, well, we kind of bounce ideas off each other in terms of topics. Um, I also help with the marketing and social media and also some of the visual graphic stuff. Mm-hmm. So like the cover art. And so why is it important for you to, to be involved in, in, in this work with your partner? Um, I think it's because we can really, we work together in the past and we work really well together and I feel like our skills complement each other. So he's very good at telling stories and I'm very good at the technical stuff. Mm. Yeah. Are you also Cree? Yeah, I'm Cree as well. And do you speak the language as well? Um, Not as well as Nick and not as well as I would like to. So I feel like um, this podcast is almost an opportunity for me to learn more about my language and our stories. Oh, have you been learning more or? Yes, I have. Yeah. What kinds of things have you been learning? I think just some vocabulary because the Cree I do know is very general conversation, mm-hmm. whereas Nick will tell stories and use different words that I'm not so familiar with. People can listen to my podcast and they can immerse themselves when they listen to it. Because there's no translation provided. Yeah, there's no translations provided. Exactly. So that was the kind of the other part of the idea where, you know, people can just listen and then maybe learn a word. And then by just listening or just immersing themselves, they'll be able to learn. Yeah. Do you fight in English or Cree? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like um, maybe if I'm like really mad, I'll react in Cree, but generally it's in English. <laughs> well, thank you, Nick, for thank being you. here with me today. And Amanda. Thank you so much. Thank you. Nick Wapachi and Amanda Quinn are the team behind In Iwischi, a podcast produced in the East Cree language. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169, and Native Voice 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild. Earlier this season, we headed down to Albuquerque, New Mexico for Indigenous Comic Con. And one story that really stuck with us from that trip has to do with Jedi's, Jawas, and the Navajo language. <laughs> Still to come, how Star Wars is helping preserve the Navajo language. (music) 
When you think of language, you probably think of words being spoken. But what if you can't hear those words? Max Ireland's wife, Marcia, is deaf. Growing up in the Oneida Nation of the Tame, she often felt left out, silenced from her culture because no one could translate from Oneida to American Sign Language. But now, with the help of Oneida language expert Elder Olive Elm, Marcia and Max have created an Oneida Sign Language. Welcome, Max. Hi, good afternoon. So tell me, why did you and Marcia decide to create an Oneida Sign Language? Basically, it was uh, found to be a necessity, and it was also a way of uh, rejuvenating our language in a different way. Uh, and it had never been done before, and it was a way of uh, inclusion for our family to be involved in our ceremonies and uh, traditions within our Oneida longhouse. Mm. What was it like for Marcia to grow up in the community not being able to communicate with people? Well, obviously it limited her uh, communication abilities. Luckily, she found some people that wanted to be friends with her, and uh, they uh, struggled to learn the, learn the language alphabet mostly with ASL. That was the way that they communicated. What about um, cultural things like ceremonies? Was she able to participate in those things? No, it was all visual to her. She didn't really understand what was going on and until uh, later. Her dad, Charlie Elijah, he was uh, a chief involved in a longhouse, so she, she was there quite a bit, but uh, unfortunately the translation and everything didn't occur to her until later on. Mm-hmm. What aspects of her culture um, was she feeling excluded from because she was deaf? Pretty well all of it, because mm-hmm. she couldn't understand what was being said and uh, didn't get the meaning behind uh, things that were being um, told to other members of the community. Mm-hmm. So even though she was surrounded by culture, it was very lonely. Yeah, it was uh, It was uh, being at arm's length. Now, I understand that Marsha is not the only person in your family who's deaf. Tell me who else is benefiting from your new Oneida Sign Language. Yeah, we have nine grandchildren, mm-hmm. seven of who are hearing impaired, and uh, we have five children that are deaf. So it's not only them, but it's, uh, I think, our latest poll we gathered was like 22 members in our community that are have hearing loss. So it's a benefit to them, and uh, it's also a benefit to the new learners that are learning, hearing members that are learning on Ida, that they can associate the language with the signs. Mm-hmm. So in some cases, that makes it much easier to remember. If they can't remember the word, they can use the sign. What effect has it had on your family with so many people that have hearing loss and now they have this language to talk to each other in? What's it been like? Oh, it's been great. Really um, been a a chance of inclusion within the community Mm -hmm. where there wasn't one before. So uh, it's been uh, really good. And then the children are participating. My my adult children are participating and my grandchildren are participating. We go through and say, well, this is the word. This is what it means. What do you think a, a good sign would be? So we've all they've all taken part in that. Mm-hmm. So it's been a family affair to develop and enhance our language. And what was it like for Marcia to be able to communicate after a lifetime of silence? Oh, it's been uh, it's been amazing to see her transformation from being a wallflower to coming out and standing up in her community and standing up for her community. She's become an advocate uh, not only on the, in Canada's borders but also at Standing Rock. She interpreted ASL over there for uh, the New York Times for the deaf members that were at Standing Rock mm. that, that were part of that process there. You must have been really proud of her. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. She created the the sign for, with help from the other deaf members there, for uh, Kill the Black Snake. And uh, she's also created the sign for Indigenous here in Canada. Mm-hmm. It's the land, the water, the people. Wow. Now, all three signs are put together to make Indigenous. Wow. Explain to me, Max, the process of creating the language. How did you do it? Well, we work with our elder... All of Elam, and uh, we go and uh, we did the Thanksgiving address. So the English version 
and then she does the Oneida version, and then she gives us back the Oneida version rather than the English version. So we go from there and what she tells us. Then we create signs from the what the Oneida language is speaking mm -hmm. because there's certain words in the English language that don't apply in Oneida. Can you give me an example of a sign that only makes sense in Oneida? Nagiwa. That's, uh, I will see you again. So there's no goodbyes in uh, in our language. Mm -hmm. So that word Nagiwa is broken down into I will see you again. So there's one, two, three, four words there mm -hmm. in English. Mm -hmm. So that's... Uh, that's one of the one of the ways that's that's being done. Yes. Well, Max, thank you so much for speaking with me today. Thank you very much. That was Max Ireland from the Oneida Nation of the Thames near London, Ontario, with the help of Elder Olive Elm. Max and his wife Marcia created an Oneida sign language. So first off, we're in Alclagay. Can you say Alclagay? Alclagay. 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 Old Masset. Old Masset. It also means our village. Mm -hmm. And our language... The Haida language is another piece of culture nearly lost in the devastating waves of smallpox, residential schools, church and government interventions. Because Haida Gwaii is an isolated place hours from any major city, so too is the Haida language. It's an isolate language, which means it's not attached to any language tree. It started here and then migrated as far as the Haida people went, some to Alaska, some to Vancouver Island, and across the country. While there's only a single Haida language, there are some dialectal differences between the communities. Southern Haida is spoken in Skidigit, and northern Haida that's spoken in Masset. Once, not that long ago, all Haida were fluent in the language. Today, the number of speakers is down to three or four dozen. Nearly all of them are over the age of 70. But there is hope. Many younger Haida want to learn their ancestral language, and communities like here in Old Masset, language nests are being made. Kunjade is one of the few speakers and teachers of the language. A few times a week, she walks the short distance from her home to the Haida Youth Center in hopes of restoring her language to the next generation. Which is kind of unfortunate because our language is dying. And I have hope, though, because we have little kids that come to our nest pro language nest program here. And maybe they're nonverbal, but they're going to hear the sounds. They can hear our pinches. <laughs> He honestly looks like he understands what you're saying to he, him. He does understand. I don't know who you used to be, but you used to be somebody. You used to be somebody, and you remember to speak that language, don't you? I don't know if you have a hide name yet. Yes, you know your name. <laughs> oh. Oh, 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 oh. We have expressions that go deep in our throats, like... <laughs> this is something, an, an expression a nanny or a grandmother would use. If her grandchild were, was up to something that they shouldn't be doing, she might poke them in the ribs and say... <laughs> and you would know right away, Oh my God, nanny caught me! I better stop doing this. Mm -hmm. And they, didn't, they wouldn't have to discipline you any other way. So what happened? Why, why is it dying? Residential school residential school. First, what happened was we had a smallpox epidemic. I think we had a couple of waves of the epidemic. In um, the second, After the second wave, uh, they say our population went from 30,000 plus Haida's. We had villages everywhere there's a beach on Haida Gwaii. And after smallpox wiped every single village out except for Old Masset and Skidigit. So there are some ancient villages today where there are no descendants. At all, and there were some villages where there was one survivor or two, but there are a lot of villages where there there was nobody that was left. And right after that, the missionaries swooped in and converted the survivors to Christianity. We had to give up our traditional names. It became illegal, like it did right across the country for Indigenous people everywhere. 
and we had to give up our traditional homes. We had to we had to put on European style clothing. We weren't allowed to practice our feasts anymore. So many things we weren't allowed to do, sing our songs and stuff too. And then right after that, right after that, what happened to our Indian day schools. Um, and then after that residential school, they were taught the shameful things, that it was old-fashioned to practice those ways. It was old-fashioned to speak our language. And so the kids came home, and I know my cousin's mom, uh, my auntie, she was taken when she was six, and she was returned when she was 16. So never once in 10 years did she come home. So she came home as a stranger to her parents, and her parents were strangers to her. What, did, what, what effect did that have on, on the speakers in the, in the language? I think it had a very negative effect on the speakers of the language. You know, like I know that the Chini, the reason why I speak my language is from listening to his sound files. Um, he didn't get to speak his language for 50 years. So it was 50 years before somebody came to him with a recording device and said, Chini, please, how do you say this in, in our language? How do you say this in Haida? And um, so he recorded, I don't know how many tapes with you know, phrases all surrounding one theme, you know, kind of thing. Right. But he's one of the very few that did that. And Chini is who? Chini Stephen Brown. Oh. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Got a little kid here. What? We have, student we, number one. We have student number one, and he has a little brother. <laughs> so how many speakers were left after that wave of destruction? I don't know. I think all the elders that would have been alive then, they all spoke it fluently. But they were, it was ingrained so much not to speak it, they wouldn't. But there are some people, you know, like um, they grew up and they heard it being spoken. Mm-hmm. So these people are the silent speakers. So I worked with one for four years. So she couldn't speak it to us. But if I could bring her a sentence and tell her, ask her, is this how we say this in our language? And she could tell me right away, no, that doesn't sound right. So I would ch- jumble it around or try and figure out does this sound better and then you fix it up and then I'll say it again and then she'll say oh that's how my mom used to say it mm-hmm. you know kind of thing so why is it important to you to to uh, teach these young ones as they come filing into the room why is it important for you to to teach these these young ones the Haida language well I know it's important for me because I really don't want our language to die I want it to survive it's hard work is really hard work a lot of times, uh, but it's so much fun too because there's so many, you know, parts of our language where we can't translate it into English, but it's actually funnier, you know, and it's hard to explain, you know, it kind of takes away from the humor that's that exists in there. But I know that if we teach our little kids, like these newborns to age five kids, and sometimes they're a little bit older, by the time they get to the school they'll absorb so much more of our language and they'll be, they'll be a step ahead, you know. And I guess I have hope that if we start them from this young an age, maybe it'll become a lifelong passion to want to continue to learn the language and find somebody, anybody, that they can practice the language with. Oops, could you ask, what's another song they like singing? What's your little guy's name? Emsley. He's four months, and my oldest is 19 months. His name's Seth. And what's your name? Pansy. How do you say your name in your language? Uh, and that means? Big Heart. And why do you come here, Big Heart? Because uh, my sister works here. <laughs> and it's good because my son's learning lots from her. Why do you want your kids to learn the language? Because they're the future. <laughs> After we're gone, they're the future. And just them hearing it, just me hearing it when they talk, I I know a little bit of it. I, I know how to follow them when, when they start talking some languages. Or just the Haida language, I mean. So maybe one day they'll teach you. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> About an hour into the day, Kunja Day starts to sing. <laughs> and the kids gather and come towards her to listen 
intently, like they've heard this song before. The Haida Language Nest meets at the Haida Youth Center in Old Nasset a few times a week. Kunjade is one of two language speakers that teach there. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169, and Native Voice 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild. Now, when you think Star Wars, you might not immediately think indigenous language preservation, but bear with me. Five years ago, the Navajo Nation thought of a creative way to help preserve their language. They decided to translate one of the most iconic films into Navajo, a language spoken by 170,000 people. Navajo Star Wars is the first major film dubbed into the language, and it was a big hit. Imperial Senate, it's gotten Shlom Alderon, Gok Eben Yesha. Rebel Alliance, Menard Chin, you were to Oshos. That's the coolest thing ever. This year at Indigenous Comic Con, the cast was reunited, and the film was screened for Comic Con goers. Unreserved's Stephanie Cram spoke to Star Wars fans leaving the theater. I'm Sean Hungiva. I'm from the Navajo Nation, Navajo and Hopi. And the first time I actually went in and watched it, I was like, this is the best thing ever. I have no idea what they're saying, but this is the best thing ever. It really wanted me to learn more about my language, actually. It was pretty interesting. I mean, they are preserving the Navajo language. You know, it relates to the the young people, you know, that still are into Star Wars. They know some of the words, so... They, they, they enjoyed it. It was interesting, you know, being able to, uh, you know, they matched it up there pretty well and really made it really good. Voice actors don't often get fame and recognition for the work they do, but at Indigenous Comic Con, all eyes were on the cast of Navajo Star Wars. <laughs> In 2013, open auditions were held for the cast, and Marvin Yellowhair, who plays Darth Vader, jumped at the chance to read for the movie. I auditioned for, for the character. On a spur of the moment, I read in the paper that they were, they were doing a Navajo Star Wars. I tried out, and uh, I got the position. I'm glad I did it, because it was in an effort to preserve the language. With the casting, there was one surprising choice that was originally kept a secret from fans. Star Wars has been translated into several languages, but this time, C-3PO was voiced by a female, Jerry Hungiva. The only female voice that was available to audition for was Princess Leia. Really, I just wanted to see what it was like to get inside the studio where they were doing all the audition. And, you know, every time the door opened a little bit, I tried to look in there to see what's going on. The only way I knew I could get into that room is if I actually tried out for a character. C-3PO was actually the shorter list of all the characters. Uh, If you go to each table, you can see how many people are auditioning that day and what number you're sitting at. So I just went by basic statistic and thought I might have a greater chance with with C-3PO because the list was very short. Beyond trying out for the character with the fewest competitors, Jerry says she relates to C-3PO. I have two younger brothers, so it was very natural for me to be C-3PO, always trying to talk to R2-D2, trying to keep him in line, trying to keep him out of trouble, and being the mature, logical one. So I felt like being the oldest sister for two younger brothers, who was they were always mischievous. If my parents were going out of town, they wanted to us to do some cleaning and some chores my and then they said you know don't let your brothers ride the three-wheeler till they're done and you know what my parents were out the door and they were off (laughs) i'm stuck with all the chores so i really could relate to c-3po being the oldest sister of two younger siblings and Jerry enlisted a little help in creating the perfect C-3PO voice. My, my son's been a good coach. He's more a Star Wars uh, freak than I am. 
and he knows every little part. He goes, Mom, you're going to have to do Navajo, and then you have to sound, make it sound British, and then you have to say it fast, and then you have to say it robotic. So when you hear the voice, you can see how a tad little bit of more British, you know, you got you to gotta incorporate that with the Navajo. But that was challenging, but I had fun with it. Jerry has taken her love for C-3PO out of the studio and into the real world. At Indigenous Comic Con, she was wearing a costume to match her character. I'm wearing my C-3PO belt, which has all the wiring kind of sticking out like that he normally does, and the the very famous golden belly. Obviously, I'm a female, so I wanted to also depict that this is a very feminine costume. It's a very feminine top with a corset, and I designed it myself. I sewed it. I knew what I wanted, and the sewing, the creativity, that's the fun thing about cosplay. James Villagoti played Grand Moff Tarkin and said working on the film was an inspiration. There I met excellence people who do sound the best of the best and I met seven or eight Navajo speakers, Navajo experts on culture and tradition the best of the best and so it was an inspiration to me at multiple levels James says playing a villain was fun, especially in one particular scene. The part where uh, General Tarkin says go kill Princess Leia was was my was my finest moment, you know, and 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 to be able to go, it just felt good. <laughs> We've entered the Alderaan system. Governor Tarkin, I should have expected to find you holding Vader's leash. I recognized your foul stench when I was brought on board. Charming, Tinda. Many of our children no longer speak Navajo. The reason being because we have so many influences now in this world. And so like when you get stopped by a policeman, you're speaking English. When you go to court, you're speaking English. When you're telling someone that you love them, it's English. When you're singing a song, it's English. Radio, TV, Google. Everything is English. So you really become an English-speaking person. And Star Wars has made it possible to open a world of speaking Navajo. And that's what I appreciate the most about being a part of Star Wars. For Unreserved, I'm Stephanie Crown. If you want to see pictures of some of the Jawas waiting in line to check out Navajo Star Wars, you can find them on our site, cbc.ca slash unreserved. That's it for this week's episode of Unreserved. We'll be back in this radio space next week for more community culture and conversation. This episode was produced by Stephanie Cram, Kyle Muzika, Zoe Tennant, and Anna Lazowski. Special thanks to Karen Pauls, Brett Purdy, and Katie Toth this week. If you want to get in touch with us, you can email us at unreserved at cbc.ca or find us on Facebook and Twitter. I'm your favorite cousin, Rosanna Deerchild, coming at you from Winnipeg in Treaty 1 territory. Thank you for listening to Unreserved on CBC Radio 1. I go say For more CBC Podcasts, go to cbc.ca slash podcasts.